All right, let's, let's start. Now I'm recording. So, Sue Wilson is going to hear whatever we said because she's not going to be here. So, keep it clean, please. Um, <laughs> can't talk about her anymore. Okay. Not that we have. We haven't, Sue. We haven't been talking about you. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for guiding us here and help us understand your word in the name of Christ. We pray, Amen. We're talking about a. Uh, we're talking about Romans. When you look at Romans, what Paul's intention is? Get to Rome. You get to Rome, and what has changed in Rome? It's going to shape this letter. The Jews are coming. Okay, you got a bunch of Jews coming back to Rome, and a Christian church doesn't know how to handle it. Handle it, you know, because we got Jews that that are have a different perspective. In particular, the Jews view what's the big what's the, the big law. Jewish thing? The law. The law. The law. Yeah, the, even Jewish Christians are viewing the law as something that is really important and special. And Gentiles are kind of struggling with that. All right. So we've got this influx, and so Paul is writing to a church he doesn't know, doesn't know him, wants to preach the gospel, and wants to do it in a way that will help the church adjust to. Really, a changing, you know, demographic, you know, a changing yeah. culture. Well, you know, and, and now that, and I hadn't even thought of it before. It's like public for yes, well, in a way, we're dealing with that in the church now. You know, that the demographic is changing and the culture is changing, and so how do you deal with a changing, changing culture? You know, and that's what Paul is dealing with with the Romans. Now, he wants to preach the gospel in Rome. He's got to establish that the gospel, everybody in the Roman church needs to hear. Because he doesn't need to deal with the divided church. How does he show what, that everybody in the Roman church needs to hear the good news? What does he establish? Sin. Everybody's a sinner. And what does he hold out as the sign of sin? Of idolatry. And idol worshipers do what? What do idol worshippers do? They worship idols. Okay, they worship the creation rather than the creator. Some of them run around and worship bushes and sticks and stuff. You know, other people worship horses. Yeah, other people worship. We don't want to go through all the animals that people worship. Uh, but so some people worship idols and that kind of jazz. Some people worship themselves because they put themselves up as God. Other people work well. How does he show that people worship in that? Well, they, they judge. Other they people. judge the people that are worshiping books and st- bushes and sticks and stuff. So they they are standing as God judging them, which means they must see themselves as pretty important if they are the judge speaking for God. And others, these new folks coming in town, they worship the law, the law. and they obviously worship because they don't follow. Them. Okay, so everybody's sin is universal, therefore the good news is universal. And, or the need for the good news is universal. Now, what does Paul see as the, the, the core in the good news? What does, he, what does he call the, what word does he use to refer to the relationship between, us? Uh, so, okay, righteousness. See, it, it, the good news comes down to a right, our, a righteous, having a righteous relationship with God. A right relationship with God. And from God's side, how, what is, what is coming from God's side that establishes relationship? The, the gift. The, what, okay, it's a gift. What is it? Grace. grace. Okay, we got the gift of grace. God gives us the gift of grace, which means God chooses to love us. You know, or not chooses to love, he loves us anyways. But he, he, he chooses to give us grace, bring us into relationship, desire relationship. And how do we respond? By faith. We respond by faith. And faith is simply... Hoping. Well, not even... Believing. 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 Yeah, believing or the word I really like is tr- trusting that God has done it. Trusting and all. You know, it's, yeah, it's not really doing anything. It's like trusting that it's been done. And as soon as you trust that it's been done, the relationship is, you have a righteous relationship. Now he's already established though that we're sinners which causes a problem we're going to talk about righteous relationship although it doesn't affect 
what God gives to us, but it surely affects how we respond. If we're all sinners, in particular, if we set up idolatry. So what does Paul suggest about sin in terms of sins, uh, our relationship with it? What's happened with sin? You don't want to... Okay, sin, sin is a force, right? Now, in order for us to be able to have faith, sin has to be dealt with, right? And we can't deal with sin because we're sinners, you know. And we worship idols, so we can't deal with sin ourselves. So who deal has to deal with sin? Okay, God, and he does it through, through Jesus. And he gives three, remember he gave three different images, all re with this related to the same thing. What is the relationship between us and sin? Answering slightly different questions, but the questions are all related. He talks about what has happened to us through Christ. Okay, we have died through Christ. And he says, that's right, he says that sin, the power of sin is broken when you die. You know, dead people don't, aren't influenced by sin anymore because they're dead. Yeah, so, so you, to die, your power of sin is broken. And he says, we have died in Christ. He says, we are all in Adam. You know, and that's where the sin, we are all in sin, we're all in Adam, we become part of Christ, so then when Christ died, we died with him. And when Christ rose, we rose with, we him. Rose with him to the new possibility of life. But. And he's going to go into that more in chapter 8. The but is really important. That we'll get to the but in just a minute. Then he, then, so that's an image he uses. Then he talks about what, then he talks about being baptized into, into the death of Christ. So it's a practice that they're using. We join into Christ through baptism. Okay? So we have experienced we are the walking dead. Right? Because we have died in Christ. Now, then he uses the image, well, then even if we've died with Christ, uh, who says we have to follow Christ? Listen to God. Right? And then he uses an analogy of slavery. And what does Paul suggest about slavery? Okay, that the ownership has been transferred. Now it's interesting, in the 8th chapter, he's going to modify that a little bit. But right now, using the analogy or the metaphor of slavery, if, you're, if I am enslaved to John, I'm going to do what? What John tells me to do. You know, do I have a choice? No. No. If Eric tells me to do something, am I going to do something? Yeah. Am I going to do that? You might have to ask you. I better ask you first, right? Because if you say no, I'm an idiot if I go and do what Eric tells me to do, right? Because I am John's slave. I cannot quit. I cannot choose not to be his slave. I am his slave. I belong to him. Therefore, I am not bound to do anything Eric says. I am bound to do what John says. What Paul suggests, using metaphor, again, image, uh, we are slaves to sin. Therefore, we do what sin tells us to do, right? But now ownership has been transferred from sin, and I'm, you know, notice I'm using John as the image of sin. Uh, sin... <laughs> To, and I use Eric, which is probably a mistake. I use Kayla. Kayla to what? To God. You know, so the ownership has been transferred. And now that the ownership is transferred, who should I be as a slave? I am an idiot if I'm not listening to, to God, my new master. I'm not bound to do anything my old master says because I have a new one. You know, I have a new one. And so there, therefore we're not bound to do what sin says. We're bound to do what God says. Okay? Now they're in. But life gets in the way. Well, we, and we'll, we got to that in chapter 7. Okay, so we got, we got this, this transfer, you know, of ownership. Therefore, I am, we are bound, we are slaves to God. Now understand, he's just using it as an image. I don't think he's suggesting anything about slavery. He's just using it as a metaphor. He uses another metaphor, still dealing with the same business. You know, how, what's my relationship with sin and the law 
that shows sin. Because remember, he says the law shows us that we're sinful. The law doesn't solve sin, it just exposes it. You know, what, what's relationship? He uses the image of marriage. And in marriage, what does he say about marriage? Well, after all, you're not supposed to be uh, <clears throat> lustful in a marriage. You're supposed to stay with your own. No adultery, in other words. Yes. No, no, no adultery. And no lust in marriage. Absolutely not. That's right. If, if, uh, if your husband dies, if, a, if, if two people are married and uh, you are, you're married and you can't fool around, right? No fooling around. That's against the law, against the rule. But if, if you kill your husband, no, if your husband dies, you kill you know, yes, yeah, yeah. you kill him with kindness. Uh, you know, if, if your husband passes, are you bound to the law anymore? Heck no. no. You can marry anybody you want, except somebody else who's married, which creates another problem. But you, you're free from the law. You're not bound to the law anymore. So you are free. Now, again, I don't think this is, has anything to do with divorce and remarriage. It has everything to do with illustrating the relationship between us and sin. So three times he showed, Paul has shown that we are free from sin, right? And bound to God. And anybody with any sense, well, if you, if Paul were teaching this in a class, you know, like a, a high school, college class, everybody's writing down, taking notes, right? You're taking the notes. Because you know on the test, you're going to say, we are free from sin and bound to God. You know, because that's what we're going to put on the test. But we know what? We ain't, we, we are still doing nasty things. You know, that's right. We, we're going to put it on the test because that's what the professor wants, right? Sue can't hear you. Sue, point you talk about you now. And, and Paul knows that because in chapter 7, after establishing all this logic, uh, illustrated through metaphor, analogy, which he has developed carefully, he shifts gears and starts describing himself. And as he describes himself, all of this is theoretically true, theologically true. We are free from sin. We are no longer bound to sin. You know, we have died to sin. And then he starts describing himself. And what does he say when he describes himself? He's still a sinner. I still am a sinner. I do what I do not do. I, yeah, I know what is right. You know, in other words, I know everything that I've said is right. I know it. But you know what? I don't do it. Which I think is what John and I were talking about it earlier this afternoon. I, I think that is really cool. Because instead of trying to come up with, you know, a reasoned explanation, which is what he's been doing. He very himself. rational. He uses himself. Like and, and he, the bottom line is, because he goes through all this, I know what's right, which since I know what's right, it proves to me it must be right, but I, I still can't do it. What's what's the problem? What does Paul see as the problem? How does he describe the problem? He's got a bunch of both places. He's got feet in both places. You know, he's got he's got his one foot in a new age, the age of grace and freedom and Christ and all this stuff, but he's still got the other foot in the old age. The old, the old age that is if one is life, the other one is death. Yeah. Okay. So he's got feet in both ages. He uses the image. The flesh, that the flesh is where sin seems to exert its power. You know, sin is exerting its power in his flesh, which makes some sense because Paul is talking about in his mind he knows what's right, but his hands won't do it. You know, his hands won't do it. You know, his body just won't conform to what he knows is, is right. And he feels guilt about it. You know, 
and frustration. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? And then, his, which I think, again, is cruel because it's like he's saying, I am screwed up and you know what? I'm not even sure I understand why. Other than the sin has power over me, I don't know what to do about it. And then the last line, though, Paul, of Paul is, after he says, oh, wretched man, who can save me from this body of death? He says, thanks be to God. Because what he can't do, God has done. God has done. And therefore, even though he screwed up, now right there, he's kind of, because that was your concern, John, that, that you know, all of this sounds great on paper, but we can't do it. You know, and that's what he's saying. This is great on paper, and all of it's true. None of it's wrong. But in reality, we just, we're not able to. And therefore, we are truly fortunate that we have God, which is what he's been saying. You cannot earn it. Because if you, as soon as you start saying, well, you need to. You need to do Guess that. what? You either can't do it or you're going to screw it up. You know, and especially if sin is idolatry. You know, as soon as I hear you must do, that's, that's idolatry. Yeah. So we are, we are in big trouble. But thanks be to God. What's that? I said we couldn't root for the black guys anymore and get there ever so it would be a sad one. That's right, because that would be a sign of sin. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so so Paul, is, Paul is, all of this about sin is true, but we can't do it. Thanks be to God, God has done it. Now, when we move into the 8th chapter, because he's talked about what God has done, now he's going to start moving into, well, what actually has God done, and what's the implications of that? And doesn't he also relate that the laws have defined what sin is? Oh, absolutely. Without the laws, we wouldn't know what was sin. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things I think, and, and there's something to file away, uh, I, I think Paul, as, as he writes this, uh, and, and I think we see this throughout Paul, I think he uses the past, but he really doesn't want us to dwell on it. In, in other words, I, I don't, Paul never goes into depths about why we're sinners, you know, other than that sin is a force. Well, why is sin a force? It's, I think if Paul were there and you said, well, why is sin a power? Paul would say, I don't know. It just is. You know, I, I don't know if I've got an explanation for why it is. You know, why am I five foot, eight and a half? I don't know. I just am. And I think that's what, that's what Paul says is saying about sin. And I think that's what he's also going to say about redemption. You know, I don't know. It just is. And, and I think that's something really important to file away with Paul. You don't want to push his uh, evaluation of the past too far. Because I don't think he cares much, as much about the past as we do. I think he cares a lot about the present right now. You know, what do we do with it right now? Okay? And that's what he's going to talk about in chapter 8. You know, it's like he's done the, sort of the bad news, the worst of it, at the end of chapter 7. And now in chapter 8, he can start talking about what is, what's on the positive side of this. If God has done it, why is this a good thing? And as we open chapter 8, what do we, what do we have? Pretty good news at the beginning of chapter 8, right? No condemnation for those who are in Christ. Okay, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now, he's just said, you know, thanks be to God. Why would he say thanks be to God? Well, beginning of chapter 8, because there is no condemnation, even though he's as screwed up as he is, in Christ. Now, I want you to notice, he was in first person at the end of chapter 7, he goes back to third person. He's going back to third person. You know, so he's he's finished his little personal story. You know, now he's back to, you know, kind of getting, you got to get into that logical flow. It's like he's, you know, confessed out loud. You know, and now he's back to, you know, back up the stairs up here. Okay. Now, why is there no condemnation? Okay, we are free from the law of sin and death through Christ. Now, is this new and exciting, what he just said? Heck no. He's already said that. 
You know, he said, in fact, he said it over and over again. Five, six, seven. He said the same thing, that we have died. Why was it, why though was it necessary for Christ to set us free? Why is that necessary? Yeah, he's going to tell us, right? Why? What in verse 3 says it's necessary? In other words, what's the problem with the law? Now we got the problem with the law. It's not that it's bad. It doesn't, it doesn't cause sin. It's what we do with it. Well, what, what's the problem? It's, it's powerless. The law is weak. You know, it was weak. It was never intended to do what we idol worshipers wanted to do. And that's to make us Right with God. That's what we want the law to do. And it's kind of interesting because if if I believe the law, so any law, can make me right with God, I can be right with God by law. Who's in control? I am. I'm in control. You know, and that gives me, like we were talking about, that gives me the right to feel really good. Right? It also gives me the right to that's right, judge. Right, because I'm doing it, and you're not. You're not. And besides, you're living in the. You're no longer living in the flesh. You're living in the spirit. Exactly, but that's what he said. The the law was is too weak. You know, sin, and he's already said that sin took the law, and sin twisted the law to create something that it wasn't able to do. Therefore, what did God have to do? He had. He had, to send it. he had to fix it. He had to break it. And we know what he did through Jesus. What happened to, through Jesus that made all the difference? He died for our sins. He died. Well, remember Paul's image, and this is what I want you to, if you don't take anything outside of Rome, well, I'd like you to take other stuff. But this is one of the things, you know, that when we look at how Paul deals, not just with Romans, but in all of his letters, Paul is not going to deal with sin. As, as Jesus was the sacrifice for sin. No, never is he going to deal. It's not, he doesn't deal with the death of Christ as a sacrifice for anything. You know, the death of Christ is we are in Christ when he dies. We die in Christ. That's how Paul sees crucifixion. It's not going to be, you know, he's the innocent lamb of God who was slain for the... You know, that's, that's not Paul at all. And that's really not... You don't, that's not a strong strain of that in the Bible at all. That's, that's going to be medieval. That's later. The, the satisfaction thing. God punishes, you know, has to punish somebody, so punishes Christ for sin. That's, that's not a real strong biblical image. It's theological, but it's not strongly biblical. Paul's view of crucifixion is more corporate. We've been incorporated into Christ. We, he died, we died, he rose, in one sense, we rose. In another sense, we will rise, you know, in the, in the future. Okay. So, that, that, Paul, that Christ came to do what the law couldn't do. Okay? And, and how does that, how should that affect us? Knowing that, that, that Christ came. We know the law, or the, the sin and death, and the law that's been perverted by Sin is in our flesh, right? Causing us to do bad things. How should that... And, but we also know that Christ came to set us free from that. How should that impact us right now? What should that, what should, how should that affect us right now? Well, we should be... Okay, we, we should have a... Why? Why should we have a... You know, you know what your destiny is. Yes, it's going to be within Christ and God. So. Okay, we we know we know that the future's in God. We know we we're in God, right? We we know we're in God. He's in control of your future. He, God's going. I don't know how to say it. But well, remember, because because well, yeah, because that we allow separate ourselves from the Lord. Yes, we know because He said it in His His little description of Himself. That sin is exerting power. We're set free. But sin is exerting power in our flesh, right? Makes logical sense. 
The flesh is the thing that does naughty things. It's what we use to hurt other people. The flesh is also, you know, dies, you know, decays and dies. We're going to see that as an image here. So the flesh is, is where sin seems to have its power, but we are also experience a sense of freedom, which means spirit. And he separated. Now, spirit is different than soul. Not talking about soul. But in one, so the spirit is almost like his mind. I mean, he talks about knowing what's right, but not being able to do it. In Christ, then, even though our flesh is still gummed up with sin, yeah. In other words, we what? Are controlled by the spirit. Which well, means Well God is in control of the spirit. It's, 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 true. We have a well, we have a choice in what? In, in, in accepting the gift. Okay, we have a choice. We do have a choice, but we don't have the choice that we thought we had. Right? When we say we have a choice, we have a choice what to do, right? Do we have that choice? Heck no. Why don't we have a choice over what we do? Because our flesh is bound in sin. I don't have a choice over what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? I am going to sin. I am going to sin. Because sin is stronger than me. It is stronger than the law. It has messed up the law so much that when I hear a law given, it immediately entices me to break it. So, as you just said, it's not our choice. I know we have two parts. Well, we, we, have, we have two parts, but we do have a choice. The choice. It's not over what we do. It's over what we accept. What we accept. What's going on out here. It's not what's going on here. What's going on here is sin. We have choice between spirit and flesh. Well, not a choice between spirit and flesh. We have a... Yeah, right, right. It's all analogy. We've got the choice isn't what we do. Our flesh is bound, but our spirit is free. But this is not stronger than God. Wouldn't it be the choice right. to accept the gift? Yeah, absolutely. It, it not only to accept that's part of the choice, and that's where faith comes in. To respond back. That's exactly right. I cannot change what I do, and I don't want to deceive myself. What I do is going to be sinful. I may think it is wonderful, but the reality is, it's all gummed up in sin. And my perspective is so skewed that a lot of times I don't even realize it. But I do have a choice. The choice isn't with my hands. My choice is with my head. My spirit is free. Which means I can trust the gift, right? I can believe that God has done what he's done. You know, I can accept that the law is good, but I'm not capable of doing it. You know, I, those things I can accept. It would almost be like the difference between intellect and emotion. In a sense. Yeah. Yeah, in a, in, in a real sense. Those things I can I can accept him, or because I've been set free, I, or I can believe that I'm actually can doing good things. You know, there's no sin involved in my life. Right. That it's all up to me. That the idols I worship are truly God. I can believe that. If I believe that, what am I giving into? I'm giving into idolatry. I'm giving into the flesh, which is controlled by sin. That becomes the choice we have. Not only whether we're going to do good things or not, but what's going on up here. That's where we have the freedom. That's where God has set us free. Okay? But remember, compared to sin, how are we, how are we with respect to sin? Do, does sin, is sin stronger than us, weaker than us? Stronger. Way stronger than us. Okay? Therefore, if we are on our own, right, without any help, what's going to happen to us? Flesh is already bound to sin, so is our spirit. You know, everything is going to be bound to sin if we, because we're just not strong enough, right? But God is strong enough. Ah, God is strong enough. And when you look at verse 9, what has God done 
to help our weak little spirits that are struggling to make the right choice. He's adopted us. Well, before he adopts us, what has he done? You're right, Daddy, but he's not, we're not there yet. The Spirit of God is in us. Oh, yeah, the Spirit Right? You know, so our spirits are so weak. Our flesh is, is a mess. But even our spirits are weak. It's fine to say free, but it's, we're just going to be overwhelmed by sin. Therefore, God does what? Sends the spirit. His Spirit in us. So it's not us fighting it is, uh, it's sin. It is God. 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 That's right. That's exactly right. God is is in us, right? And how can we be sure that God is in us? How can we be sure that God is in us? That the Spirit is in us. Well, I mean, He gives another treasure. All of that's true. But he gives a, a sign, if you look at the still in verse 9, that, that the Spirit is in us. He can say in verse 9. Um, you are not in the flesh. If you don't belong to Christ, you don't have the Spirit. If you don't belong to Christ, you don't have the Spirit. Which may tell tell us, because he's writing to this Roman church, that the idea of belonging to Christ, which he's kind of talked about being in Christ earlier, was a big deal. They knew it. So the Romans believed that they were in Christ. That was something that they, they believed. They belonged to Christ. Remember, he also said our ownership was transferred You know, a little, in, in chapter 6. You know, we're no longer slaves to sin, we're slaves to God. So if we belong to Christ, then we know we have the Spirit. Therefore, I don't need to what? Worry about it. I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to get the Spirit. You know, how do you get the Spirit? Well, you don't need to get the Spirit. You belong to Christ. It's already there. Man, you got it. You know, you've got it. It's not something you've got to get. It's something you already got. You know, you don't get it, you got it. So All right. Now, how many of us you get it? get it? What's that? Well, Paul, Paul is still talking about that guilt because he's aware of that. But that's because he's looking at his flesh. You know, if the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? And because the spirit of Christ is in us, what, what is the result? Well, finally, we, we, go, yeah, we got a little bit better. What is better? A lot of it better. Even though the body is dead, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. You are in this righteous relationship with God. Okay? So we do, we do now have this duality, which is what I was saying last week. You know, we got feet in two worlds. You know, and, and although he uses flesh, I'm, I'm not sure, because he doesn't do it in another place. I'm not, this isn't this platonic thing. You know, that anything physical is bad and anything spiritual is good. I think he's just talking about, you know, kind of the duality within us, yeah. you know, and uses the word sark, which is flesh, to indicate, you know, that part of us that is dominated by sin and pneuma, which is spirit, that part of us which is filled with God, by God. But I think what he's suggesting here is this is a reality we, though, can either choose to believe it or not uh, with respect to spirit. Okay, so this is this indwelling then enables us we're in righteousness. Now, how does he describe the, uh, uh, the, this spirit? How does he describe the spirit that is in, in us? Mm-hmm. What did this spirit do in the past that's relatively important? Okay, the Spirit raised Jesus, and he's referring then to resurrection. What's going to happen then? He's going to he's going to raise us. Now he's already said he's already said that we were raised using that analogy of death. You know, we died in Christ, and we will be raised. And he uses that we can live a new life and that kind of jazz. 
What tense does he use here when he talks about being raised? He uses future tense. So now he's talking about that resurrection that he explains in great detail in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 15. You know, what this resurrection. So he's pointing to something that's going to, going to happen in the future. What difference does all of this make? Verse 12. What is the... If, if, you know, we, the flesh is influenced by sin. The spirit is where we have a choice. We still can't make the choice very well. So God puts his spirit in us to give us, to bolster us so that we're able to do this. What difference does it make? We're indebted to the flesh. Okay, we are not debtors, which means what? We say debtors uh, to, the, to the flesh. We don't know, we don't know the flesh of blessing. We don't, in other words, we don't have to, we don't have to power. Now, are we going to, are we going to follow with the fleshly? You better believe it. we're going to do it. Because, and why are we going to do it? Don't know. We just are. You know, it shows that sin still has a power. But we no longer have to do it because we have, we have got God on, we our, have side. Got God on our side. We have died according to the flesh. The spirit has put to death, and this I really love. Put to death the deeds of the body. And, and what, what, do you, what is he getting at when he says, the spirit has put to death, through Christ, the deeds of the body have been... Well, that would be the sins that you... Lord, have mercy. Everything that you've done. It, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's done. You know, when we died in Christ, we really did. And it wasn't... It wasn't you know, it, it, it wasn't just the stuff in the past. It was the, it, we are dead in Christ. We really are. So our sins, even though we still do them, are being covered by this spirit of Christ that's, that's dwelling in us. Therefore, we have no reason to feel worried. We have no reason to feel worried. Now, we may have reason to feel guilt because Paul felt guilt. Why, why, my, why do we feel, why would guilt be appropriate? Why might we feel guilt? Because we know we can't, and we know we may feel more guilt than the guy, somebody else. Because we know what's right and we can't do it. Guilt, guilt is, it's a shame. People talk about guilt being, guilt's not bad. You know, guilt isn't bad. Guilt is what prevents us from doing more, stupid more, things more, over and more, over again. So we're gonna we, guilt is what we we're gonna feel guilt. What we're not gonna feel is we're not gonna feel shame because shame involves who we are and who are we? God's children. We are, and that's right. That's where we're going. We're not gonna feel shame because we are the children of God. You know, where the Spirit is in us. There's no reason to feel shame. Maybe reason to feel guilt when we do dumb things that we know are wrong. But we have no reason to feel shame. As long as we're repentant. Well, I think for Paul, have we have no reason to feel shame at all. at all. Period. You know, we have no reason to feel shame. In fact, if we do feel shame, then we probably aren't very repentant. Because our minds haven't turned. Okay? You know, we, we have become in this shift. You know, the Spirit is in us. We've died. We are now... And he does, now he doesn't talk about slavery as in a traditional sense. We were slaves to sin. But we're not slaves to God. We're alive in the Spirit of God. Yeah, we are alive in the Spirit. In fact, what are, what are we with respect to God now? Lord have mercy. We have become yes. You're bonded with him. the children. <laughs> Verse 14. We are the children of God. You know, we have we become the children of God. Now, where is where is this happening? This is happening up here. What's our flesh doing? Bad thing. Still influenced by sin. But here we can trust that we have been adopted as children of God. Now, what do children receive that slaves don't receive? Okay, they, they receive they receive love. They receive what else do they receive? Grace. They receive their heirs. They receive an inheritance. Slaves never inherit. 
you know, don't inherit anything. But Paul even tells us the two things, two of the things that benefits we get out of being children of God. What's the first benefit that we get? Which I think is tied to this love business. What can we do that no slave can do? We can go to, to God and call Him Father. Father. But even beyond Father, we can call Him Abba. And what's the difference between Abba and Father? We can approach God and call Him Abba. What is Abba? What does, what does that mean? Yes, I know. <laughs> Dancing queen. Yeah, there you go. Here the beach. Yeah, that's girl group. Yes, I kind of wish I hadn't done that. Uh, more, not, not because I'm embarrassed, but because it kind of hurt. Yeah, I don't know what I'm telling you. Yeah, the weakness of the flesh. Abba, Abba, Abba means that's that was in Hebrew what the Aramaics called their well called their daddies. I mean, it's like calling them daddy. Oh, I mean, it's, it's a very personal, it's a very personal. A loving and personal relationship. You know, so it's not just, yes, Father, I am here, Father. Can you help me, Father? But it's like saying, it's a Dad, you know, Maggie calls me, well, Maggie calls me <laughs> the Reverend Doctor, but that, that's <laughs> not what uh, Look, if my mother call, has to call me that, so does my dog. <laughs> Uh, so we we are able to we're able to approach God as child child to parent and and what is the second and under, notice that's in the present and what's the second benefit we're heirs we're okay so if we are the children of God we can approach God as his children. As dad. Yeah. We can also be sure that we're going to inherit. We're part of the we're part of the will. You know, sort of like I'm going back to Virginia in a few weeks because I need to make sure that I'm part of the will. Uh, you know, we'll uh, <laughs> What's wrong, Susie? What are you going to do if you're not? Yeah, well, I don't know. I'll be calling him up or some, you know. That that'll be bad. I swear I will be through there Saturday. He'll be washing his feet. That's what I'm doing. All right. Um, so that's what we have in the present. Now Paul then starts talking about about future with the future. What? How does Paul describe this this future? Because he says, you know. The problem, and, and John, I think you've kind of alluded to it before. You know, it's fine to say, you know, we can call him daddy, we can, we, we're going to be heirs, but you know something? Life now is not great. I mean, it's it's kind of kind of tough. And you know, it's again, I can see people. I I always see classrooms. You know, kids taking notes. Oh, yeah, we're, we're set free. We're children of God. Oh, we get all these benefits. And they're thinking, you know, why isn't that great? But I'll say it on the test. You know, I'm going to give them whatever. Well, Paul doesn't want to do that. If, when, he, when we look at, as he continues his argument, verse 18, what, what, what does he recognize about life right now? What does he say? That life right now stinks. You know, life stinks on ice. It really does. And, and life now, though, it's not worth comparing. is not worth comparing what? What's going to happen in the future? Now, what, what does Paul say? Because we got this series of fours, just like we've seen over and over again in this letter. We got a whole bunch of fours where he's explaining what he means. That life now, you can't compare to life in the future. What is happening now? Okay, all of creation, which kind of makes it interesting. What then is he suggesting? Logically makes sense. What is he suggesting about all of creation? 
Kind of an, he's making kind of an interesting suggestion. If all of creation is awaiting the revelation of the sons and daughters of God, or bound in futility, what is he suggesting about what's happening in creation? <laughs> Close. What is he? What is he saying? What is he saying about what the reality of sin? Sin affects everything. Sin has perverted not just the law and us. Sin has perverted the entire created order. Now, even the, and he's going to explain. He's going to explain that. But even if he doesn't explain it, we can already say. Well, yeah. Uh, little Zuzu, my hamster, at home. Maggie's hamster at home, which I feed it and clean. It. But it's her hamster. <laughs> little Zuzu is influenced by sin. How do we know Zuzu is influenced by sin? Because he does bad things. Well, what's that? He does bad things. <laughs> well, no, he, well, how do we know? I mean, the, how can I definitively know that Zuzu is affected by sin? Zuzu's going to die. Zuzu's going to die. Or that he may change his shoes up. He may, if I let him loose. Zuzu's going to die. Even those turtles in my office are going to die. Because what happens in creation? What is that? What's the law? Uh, is it entropy? What's that law that, that because I know nothing about science, where everything kind of grinds to, sort of slows down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that therefore the universe has got to, you know, it's... it's, 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 it's Yeah, we yeah, uh, well, then, then if I roll, if I roll something on well, yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't know science. That's why I taught history because I couldn't add or spell. Uh, so, if, but everything, everything wears down. Everything breaks down. You know, right? Tom Jones. Heck, playing tennis, Tom Jones. Well, Tom Jones is an exception to the rule because Tom Jones doesn't wear down. Tom Jones is still. It's still uh, uh, Yeah, he's, that's, that's exactly right. I can tell you, after playing tennis with my daughter, I believe you. Okay, every, even creation. Even creation wears down. And it's as though creation understands it because what is creation waiting for? What is the creation waiting for? Okay, Eric doesn't know, and, and that's fine. Uh, what is creation? Creation is waiting for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. Waiting for redemption. Waiting for liberation. Great, waiting for redemption. Are they experiencing redemption now? Heck no. You know, because things are dying right and left. For, and we know that because we, are, we were saved, right? But only in hope. We were saved, but only in hope. So salvation isn't something we experience now. It's something we experience in the future. And all of it's not just us waiting for it, but everything. everything. Now you said don't, don't, don't go to heaven. I, see, I believe that. And I believe that based on scripture because when you read Revelation and the images, they talk about animals around the throne. Think about all these people who have the your death experience, whatever that yeah. That's all symbolic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I think I think there's I also think when when and Isaiah describes the peaceable kingdom where the lion will lay down with the lamb. These are animal images. I think certainly in scripture. Now, since I believe that all of this is metaphor anyway. You know, does it mean yes. that actually, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. It makes me feel good. Now, Debbie says she'd rather go to hell because she's allergic to every single animal <laughs> that will be in the future kingdom. Every animal she'll be allergic to. Every one. Well, if, if there's animals there, she will. She won't. You know. And Maggie, there better not be Nuts from trees. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, but it's a dry season. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, or dry coats. That's <laughs> right. It's free from, from all disease and all of that when you get back. Right? What's that? You're supposed to be free from all the disease and all of that. So she won't have that problem when she won't have that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to encourage Maggie to take her EpiPen <laughs> with her just in case somebody slips her I a walnut. I don't believe she'll need it. Which is really disappointing. Now, just out of, and this is really short, every year, every year now, we have to get Happy for for Maggie, you know, because she's allergic to walnuts, uh, uh, tree tree nuts. She's allergic to tree nuts. She can do peanuts. Oh, yeah, that's oh, all. Yeah. Peanuts it yeah. Yeah. But she, we got to be real careful because she's allergic to pecans and walnuts and all that. Stuff. But you know, we get these happy pins, and you know what we do with them every year? Throw them out. Because Throw them out. I I would like to see her use. You know, oh, I would like to see her use them. Because we pay for them. Yeah. You know, so I think I tell her, Maggie, yeah. they were, you know, how about some Expire. butter uh, ice cream, you know? <laughs> Just and then we could do the EpiPen, you know, on it. At least you'd be getting your money for the fun. I'm a good dad. <laughs> that, you ever had to use them? No. Well, you don't want that heart rate going flying. No, no, you don't, you don't want, want that? Well, no, no, but Sue, well, I'm not going to just give it to her well, for the heck of it. Yeah, that's How can they drink all of us? And then give it to her. They should make EpiPens that don't expire. <laughs> That you wouldn't have to throw. Well, you know, you know something. It's something like if you've ever seen that Seinfeld episode where Jerry changes the size on his jeans. We can always change the expiration on the epipen. I think they said it would take five. Yeah, but you don't want to take that chance. Hey, and we need to test see if the epipen is really good. Right. Yeah, that's right. She may not be allergic anymore. I think you're making a good point. All right. Yeah. On um, where we were just at, what about, you're talking about living things. Yeah. But you're talking about, when you, you said everything. Yeah. Everything also encompasses non-living things. Yes. Where does that fall in? I believe, I believe it involves non-living things. I think they everything breaks Well, non-living things don't die. They may change form, but they don't die. But they, they right. Don't die. Well, again, we're, we're talking about Somebody who has a first century view of the world and writing a metaphor. I think he would see things breaking down, even the physical world breaking down. Um, you know, the Greeks had a concept. The Greeks believed that things broke down. You know, because they could see small things breaking. And if small things broke down, they could apply it to mountains. And mountains would wear down eventually. Given enough time, they'd wear down. Well, I would say, yeah, they wear down, but they don't die. Well... Mm. True. True. Although, although I watched, I watched lava at the beginning of uh, Inside Out, and if a volcano can fall in love, <laughs> they can do anything. <laughs> okay, I think you're right, and I and I, but I do think he's saying all creation. When he says creation, I don't think he's just limited. Well, that could apply yeah. to today's astrophysics. Sure, with the universe because. Everything you know, is still expanding. The universe is still expanding, but mm -hmm. if you try to put God in that, it kind of like it's a little cloudy. What? Well, God isn't cloudy. He's crystal no, clear. I mean, no, I know. Mean, <laughs> what? 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 I think Paul, if he could write now, and if Paul were writing now, he would know quantum physics. I mean, he. Yeah, I, yeah, uh, I, I mean, he just know. I would uh, think he would too. I think yeah, I think he would know. You know that that I think God is surrounding. What's, what's exciting is the universe is expanding, but God is surrounding the expansion. You know, which is kind of an amazing thing. Because if something is expanding, even though you know you talk about curving in on itself, there's, there's a, something around it. That you know, expanding universe is within God himself. Uh, I am what you would call a panentheist. Uh, a pantheist believes everything is God. Uh, I'm not a pantheist. I don't believe everything is God. I believe I'm a panentheist. And this, that's Greek. That means and everything is within God. 
Everything is within God. And God is within all things. You know. Now, it doesn't mean all things are good, but God is everywhere. So everything is within the presence of God, including things like time and space is all within God. So that's what I mean. Because I think that's what I think that makes logical sense. Okay, so human beings, we are uh, now, if if that means we still face problems in this life, what what? How does this presence of God within us help us as we deal with the problem I've got with my cracked ribs? With what? Cracked ribs. Oh my! Yeah. I, uh, how does it? How does it help? How does knowing that we are, you know, God is within us? Help me deal with my cracked ribs. Well, I I guess you pray to him. One, I won't always have cracked ribs. Yeah. I also, the spirit, because the spirit is in me. I don't know, Paul says, we don't really know how to pray. But even that's okay. Because guess what happens? He listens to us anyway. Because who actually, who actually is praying? Who actually does know how to pray? I think we all know he, well, you know, he does. You know, he he intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. So, you know, don't even worry about praying. You know, praying is good. Pray, pray, pray. But don't worry that you're not doing it well enough. Because I guess what? Guess what? God's doing it anyway. Because there's a connection between us and, and God. Okay, so God is in us. In light of that, we know what can we be confident of. Even when life really stinks, God's in control, and somewhere in the end, good is on the last page. Evil doesn't win. All things are going to work together for good. Doesn't mean all things are good. But you know something? In the end, the last page of the last chapter, there's, we're going to see later, chapter 9, there are two words, mercy, compassion. The last page, all, all things work together for good. Now, it may not feel good, but in the end, it'll work out. There's good. And how can we be sure of that? How can we trust? Not sure. Wrong word. Paul never talks about being sure. You know, how, why can we trust that? Because the Spirit is within us. And the Spirit even gives us the ability to accept it. You know. And that's, that's pretty good. Okay, Paul's going to come in for our land in verse 9, 31. And we'll go through this pretty, pretty quickly because he's really summarizing what he's talked about. Concludes this part of the letter. What can we say based on everything he's written? You know, from chapter, the middle of chapter 3 through cha- this part of chapter 8, what can we say according to 31? Say it by hope. If, yes. What can we say to these things? If God is for us, yeah, nobody can be against us. Nobody can be against us. Yeah. That's right. If God is for us, now understand, it's a question mark. Also, this is, this is one of those things that makes it tough because Greek has no grammar. The ancient Greek had no grammar. So whether these are questions or not, don't know. Don't know. They might be statements. They may all be questions. But what's interesting is I think this one is a statement, is a question. If God is for us, who's against us? Because then he's going to go through. You know, who are possibilities? If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, let's list them. Actually, you know. Well, Let's see, if God is for us, who can be against us, right? If sin is universal and the need is universal, God has dealt with all of them, has dealt completely with the need. You know, if God is for us, who can be against us? Is it God that's against us? No. No. God could be against us, but he of course isn't because he's done what for us? He's made us more than comfort, right? He's made us better because we we can trust that what's going to happen in the end. All things work together for good. 
So if who can be against him? It's God who can be against him. Is God against us? Well, of course not. God's the one that's what? He's He's for us. Doing all this stuff for us, right? Okay. So, if, so who else could be against us? It doesn't matter. You know, God can't be against us because God's the one that does it. God's the one that justifies us, right? All right, let's think of somebody else. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who could be against us? God is. Who's another possibility? Well, well, Jesus could be against us. If God is for us, who could be against us? Jesus, that's a possible answer, right? Why is, why is Jesus, why is that not a viable answer? You could say, well, what about Jesus? Well, Paul says, well, let me tell you what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? Yeah, he died for you. You know, you're right. Jesus could be against you. He really could. But what did Jesus do for you? He died for you. And he can't be against us because he's God. Lord, have mercy. Remember what he said earlier about dying? You know, that people, a person may die for a, a good person. You know, Paul says, you know, remember a person, you know, I, a person may die for a good person. But Jesus did what? Died for everyone. Died for everyone and everyone is what? You know, he died for the worst. He died for the worst. So is a guy that dies for the worst against you? No. Of course not. You know, and now, okay, you know, let's go through a whole laundry list. You know, what, what, could, be a, what could be against you? Blah, 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 blah. My, you know, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Boom. For I'm convinced he's responding. This, he's responding. He's explaining what he's already said. Now, what does this say about God? He takes care of us. What it would be true. That's what God does. What does it say about God? What is this saying about God? Okay, one, God loves. What else? Yeah, well, that's right. God, and why is that? Because God is all powerful. There's a, there's a great theologian, great theologian, had no unwritten thought. I mean, the volumes and volumes of, of stuff named Karl Barth. And Karl Barth, and I read uh, the, the Church Dogmatics, and it's a long, painful book. That book, volumes, it's like 29. Uh, but one of the things Karl Barth describes God, God, he says God is perfect in love and God is perfect in freedom. And in freedom he includes, he is free from limitations. Limitations of power, space, time, you know, all of it. So he's not going to say God is all powerful because, you know, God is also eternal. So he kind of lists, puts that under God's freedom. And God is perfect in both. In a sense, that's what Paul is saying here. You know, God is is all. You know, God is all. And how does that influence us? What do, how does that impact us? It gives us comfort. Yes, it gives us comfort. Because he's there. He's there, and how do we know that? We know it by faith, and how do we have faith? Because that same God who is all of those things, His Spirit fills us, gives us the opportunity, the ability to believe. And so not only has God solved the problem from His side, He's done what? Solved it from our side. All we have to do is relax, and recognize. That's all we have. And enjoy the room. That's all we have to do. But don't have any fun. Yeah. <laughs> but don't have any fun. That's right. Because that's very, that's important to Presbyterians. You Catholics can have all the fun you want. But we Presbyterians, we Presbyterians can't have any fun. Yeah. That's right. What's that? Oh, no, 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 no. Cecilia, I am so serious. Uh, there is no fun in the Rudiger hat. 
I will guarantee you, there is no fun in, in the root of grass. Now, understand, Paul has, has done something to the 8th chapter that is absolutely remarkable. What has Paul done by the time we get to the end of the 8th chapter? What has Paul done by this point in the letter? And we're not done with the letter. What has he done by this point? In fact, I don't even think we've gotten to the most, the most important point. I think he's given them hope. Well, he's given them Okay, tell me what he's done to give, to give hope. What has he accomplished at this part of the life? Sorry, informed that I told them they're all worthless and that brought them back up. Yeah, and God yes. to control them. Oh, that's a great way to put it. You know, he has absolutely torn them down that you have nothing, that you are powerless, that you are sinners, that what you have hoped for is, is you put your hope in the wrong place because you put it in law. Knock down everything. And then. And then build up, and the foundation is is God, not you. Except they're not going to say external, you know. The, the, it's well, or they're not going to say internal. It's not building. It's going to be totally external. You are still nothing, but God has made you in value. God has made you in value. He's got our backs. Yeah. He's in you, within you know, any good thought is what's coming from God. You know. But you're still screwed out, Daddy. You are still screwed out. And you're sinning all the time. You're gonna be leaving here and you're gonna start I, sinning I as soon as you go. What? I knew that. Yeah, I know, because y'all are I don't know what y'all are gonna do, but it's gonna be sinning. Now, this isn't this isn't now Paul has made this point. I don't think this is his big point. Now he's just established set the table. And broad, he, the issue is still, how is this Gentile church going to deal with Jews? Because if all of this is true, then what do you do with God's people who have done what? Rejected God. Rejected Christ. Rejected Christ, which for Paul is the same thing. What do you do with the Jews who have obviously rejected God? Christ. Either God has changed his mind, which means everything he's just said is not worth anything. If God changes his mind, then this, this is worthless. Right. You know, it's not, it's, it has no value. Because God may change his mind again. again. And none of this be valid. Anymore. What God is going to do with the Jews is absolutely essential, not only for the Roman church, but it's, it's essential to establish this theology. This, establish, this theology is only true if God, if the Jews are still God's people, the problem is they've rejected their sins. It's sort of like what Terry said. He, he's broken them down, but now he's got their attention. Now he's got their attention. Yeah. And and we still and, and that's what he's going to deal with and he's going to spend three chapters. And I think it is it is, it is absolutely <laughs> crucial because I think it involves what we see God doing right now. I think the most important chapter is chapter eleven. You know, this is this is exciting. For chapter eleven, the rubber hits the road. Okay, and then twelve, he, he talks about Athens. He goes down, which he always does. Paul always shifts to, to that, the sub one. Okay, any questions? What happened to your ribs? Uh, you don't. You didn't hear my story. No, I it, just a tiny, do really in a nutshell. Playing tennis with Maggie. Reaching and I can't do it for. I can lift my arm. That doesn't hurt. Uh, I can reaching for a shot with my tennis racket. As I'm going, my hamstring, which still hurts, <laughs> tightened, pulled. You and Rory not pulled, right? Well, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, it tightened. Usually, when a hamstring, you've had hamstring tightened. You know, you go. Ugh. Well, not when you're going down. <laughs> you know, when it tightens, you don't go, Ugh. I went, I mean, I went, bang. I, you know, Betty, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know how, and I'm not going to say grace of God, because plenty of people have this injury and are Christians and wonderful. I'm, I'm just lucky. Uh, I, I didn't land on my elbows, which would have, I would, have, would have had real problems. Didn't I scraped my knee, but I didn't fall hard on my knee. I fell hard on my, my ribs right here. So you should and have go by yourself. Well, I was with Maggie. It's a tennis. Yeah. No, we were talking about letting, remember, letting her. 
go oh. yeah. by herself. Yeah. See? <laughs> well, I landed hard here, and I'm hoping I just sort of hyperextended, yeah, you know, strained it, because I'm getting movement back, and it hurts when I move it, which is a good sign. Yeah. You know, that's a real good sign. Not being able to move it at all was a bad sign, and I couldn't move it at all. Felt no pain, and I was really worried. I feel pain, and I can I can move it about oh I don't know about forty degrees. Uh, and you but had an X-ray. I had an X-ray. It's no break, but I haven't had an MRI, so they haven't looked at soft that tissue. Hurt. But I cracked I cracked ribs, bruised my hands. Oh, wow. Bad they X-rayed those too, but messed up my shoulder, and I still have my hamstring, which is a huge bruise back then. Wow. You know, where my hands are. And, and, but it, it distracts me from the tendonitis I have in my Achilles tendon. So now I don't worry about that so much. Uh, the hardy part, the hard part is I can't roll over when I'm sleeping. Yeah, I can't oh, roll over. Awesome. You know, I'm, I'm flat on my back, which is fine because I sleep flat on my back. <laughs> what? You can't roll over either. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little high makeup. I'm like, I know because I can't. Yeah, it's terrible. And so when, you, yeah. when you, I wake up and I want to roll over. <laughs> And I roll over, and I think one day it's going to be, you know, the ribs aren't going to hurt anymore. And I roll over, and I think, well, they're not going to hurt anymore. But it's not today, and so I roll back on my back. And, you know, I, I got up once and crawled and to lay on my stomach, because I thought maybe laying on my stomach would feel better just as a change. Because you feel so nasty. You know, when you like, and and like I was about like five or six seconds, and I said, I don't like this. Uh-huh. And so I'm back to, oh. It's <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. It's like being pregnant. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. You would have no so, idea, but it is very similar. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't even want to know. Yeah. So now you anyway, know what your turtle feels like when he gets stuck on his back? Yes, that's. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you. When I was laying on the court oh, after okay. having fallen and rolled on my back and was just laying there, and Maggie was looking over me <laughs> saying, "Dad, should I call nine one one?" You know, and you know. Yes, she probably, she probably should have. You know, in, in retrospect, she probably should have. But of course, I said no. You know, but she probably should have called. When, when was this? This was on Thursday, and and I was I was telling uh, Jackie before. I'm signing off now. Goodbye.